guys, it's Adam from Pixel, and I am incredibly, wink wink, excited to bring you the art of The Incredibles 2. An animated film uh, made by my favorite director of all time, at least animation director of all time, Brad Bird, who made The Incredibles 1. He came in later on in Ratatouille. He did one of the most recent Mission Impossibles and also is extremely well known for this. Hup, don't look for too long. The Iron Giant, my favorite animated film of all time. All time, I absolutely love it. And um, uh, Brad Bird is a huge inspiration to me artistically, not only artistically, at least his films, um, but also his, his philosophy behind his art, how he produces stuff, how he uh, functions as a visual storyteller and designer and animator is, really plays a huge role in who I am artistically to this day. You might not know this, because he, a lot of the type of art that I produce, but yes, he plays a very huge role in my life. So let's break this beautiful thing open and get a bit of a first impression. And the first impression you're probably gonna get at the beginning is just, they're kind of introducing you to the fact that this is a, a sequel, a rewrite. They're redefining certain things. They're evolving and, and uh, growing on certain original designs and, and ideas. So there's a lot of this kind of back to the drawing board type of vibe, but then the, very soon bring you right into what the story is going to be about. And in the original Incredibles 1, uh, you might remember at the very, very beginning, there's a couple of news interviews with Helen, Elastigirl, and Bob, Mr. Incredible. And in it, uh, they're asked the question, uh, do you ever think about settling down and having kids one day? And Bob says, yeah, I'd love that. I think that'd be great. And, and Helen's actually the one who ends up saying, oh, no, I don't have time for kids. I've got stuff to do. I've got a life to live. I want to adventure. I don't have time for kids. But then if you've seen The Incredibles, if you haven't, then you've lived a very sheltered life in my humble opinion. But uh, that script ends up getting flipped on their life. And Helen ends up being the stay-at-home mom who's doing her best to keep the family from being uprooted because there's a lot of controversy with Incredibles where Bob ends up really missing and moonlighting superhero work behind Helen's back. Right, so th that role ends up getting reversed. But come Incredibles 2, we're, we're back to the, that, original, that original idea where Bob is now the stay-at-home dad and, and Helen is out living the good life. She's, she's out, you know, she's being kind of like the celebrity mom superhero and, and everybody wants to be her and she's on TV all the time. And it plays into this narrative of she's trying not to make Bob too jealous because she's going to hotels and she's, you know, in front of the camera all the time and she's famous and he's completely burning out because Jack-Jack is a very high maintenance baby. Now, I can relate to this because when my son Lucas was born, um, when he was born, for the first for the first year, we didn't want to put him in private daycare because we'd had some kind of crappy experiences with private daycares. So I stayed home with him for the first six months. And I went from being full-time employee to being a full-time stay-at-home dad. And then after that, for the following six months after that, I was um, I worked on the Disney show. So I only saw my family one and a half days a week, which is kind of rough. But I can very much relate to this kind of like jarring adaptation from work life to stay at home life with your kids and not sleeping and all that kind of fun stuff. So they really play into this really cool. Here's all the adoring fans and she's got, you know, anybody can be a hero with or without superpowers, right? <laughs> the kind of pep talk. And you can even see here, which I think is really cool, how they've redone her makeup a little bit because she's in front of the camera all the time now, right? So she's got to keep herself looking, looking sharp. So she's got a little bit of a, an updated makeup job, which I thought was really nice keeping that original design, but giving it a little bit of a tweak. It's subtle, but there's a lot of work that went behind that. And then we get into character designs. Now, one of the, my, the biggest things I'm a fan of when it comes to Brad Bird is animation. I love his animations and his designs. His designs are so good because he designs in a way that captures so much personality and expressiveness. And a lot of the personality resonates into their design as well. And in The Incredibles 1, in the making of DVD of The Incredibles 1, the character designer who worked with Brad, he described how he would animate and do these little kind of storyboard panels to help to flesh out the design of the character aesthetically. And this is something I've spoken about quite a bit. In fact, I think I mentioned it in my last uh, book review in Cuphead, where animating, you can check it out right here, um, where animating is one of the best ways to design because it's in movement that you kind of flesh out their physiology and how their structure, how their design fits into their personality and their movement. Vi, Violet, 
was very introverted. She had a lot of conflicting thoughts. So she would cover her, she would hide behind her hair with only one eye sticking out like this, where by the end she starts to gain her confidence and she pulls her hair back. But you can see in her face that she's a little tired because <laughs> she's still got a lot of conflicting thoughts going on, particularly since she's coming of age, but she's coming of age in a family of supers, which is an added stress, right? So she's got her personal life, but her, her, her destiny, which she's, she's at odds with. Dash, on the other hand, is, well, he's still the Ritalin kid, you know? Vi originally had the hair like this. Dash had his hair sticking out in the back like Rivali. And he's starting to fill out and he's getting a little beefier because he's starting to get his dad's structure. It's this big ass head on a little body, which I think is a really cute design. And Jack Jack, who's even more adorable than in the first Incredibles. In fact, they redesigned him a little bit more to make him even more adorable. But one of the cool things that fits into his design aesthetic was the fact that he, um, they wanted to, they made sure that his superpowers were superpowers that cannot be ignored at three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> like catching fire, right? Because the whole idea was the fact that Brad is, Jack-Jack's not gonna let Bob sleep. He's gotta be up and alert 24 hours a day. So at three o'clock in the morning when he's trying to fall asleep and then Jack-Jack goes <laughs> and catches fire, he's gotta be there with to, to put him out like in the animated uh, short Jack-Jack attack. She falls asleep with a fire extinguisher in her hand because every time he hiccups, he catches fire. So it had to be things you couldn't ignore, which I thought was such a brilliant addition to this to keep, to keep Bob constantly on his toes when he's completely sleep deprived. Absolutely adorable. And then comes, of course, if you've seen the film, uh, probably the, 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 the star of the show, the, real, the scene that really stole the movie was the scrap, was the fighting scene between Jack-Jack and the wild raccoon that tries to break into their house. And Jack-Jack won't have it. Bob's out cold. He's completely catatonic because he's completely sleep deprived. And Jack-Jack spots this raccoon in the backyard. And he just, he, he walks out and he just goes at it. And they end up going in this like, like two goats locking antlers scrap to the death in the backyard, which under normal circumstances would terrify. That'd be devastatingly frightening to a parent, but Jack-Jack's got superhero powers, so they just they just don't relent. The, this, the raccoon will not be outdone by some stupid baby, and the baby's not going to be outdone by the raccoon, and they just go at this full-out war that is the funniest thing you've ever seen in your entire life that must last like five minutes long. If you haven't seen the film, it's worth seeing it just for this one particular scene. It's absolutely hilarious. And you get all these like dramatic shots, all these color keys showing all, all these epic lighting and this moody thing while while Bob's crashed out cold. Freaking funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> now when we get into Winston, Dever or Dever, I can't remember how his name's pronounced. I'll have to watch the film again. Um, you really start to if you're familiar with Brad Bird's uh, style in design, he designs for acting. And that's one of the things that I love about it. He doesn't design for aesthetics, he designs for acting. He wants, to, he wants you to pick up on all the little nuances, the little subtleties in somebody's personality. And Winston's character is meant to be very expressive, but walk the line between, is this guy compassionate or is he a crook? He's kind of very kind, he's, he's really generous and really friendly to people he doesn't know. Like he's really invested a lot of his time and energy. So you kind of got to walk the fence with him. So he's got these kind of over the top type of design features like his nose and his eyes and his hands. He's got these big expressive hands. And he's very outspoken, but he's very expressive. So you, you're kind of trying to think when people are that expressive and over the top, sometimes they're a little full of it. Well, watch the movie if you want to find out. But this really, this, this totally makes me think of Kent Mansley from, from Iron Giant. He has that kind of expressiveness in his face. My, one of my favorite characters from Iron Giant, I might add. Ellen Dever, who, who makes me think a lot of uh, Helen Ballin Carter, and really captures her really well. Kind of like this very fashionista, dry wit type of character. Um, again, hard to read type of characters. And this is her brother, who's arguably one of the sketchiest pricks you've ever seen in your life. Could you, I mean, look at that. Tell me that's the most, not the most beautifully dark character you've ever seen in your life. I mean, phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Lucius Best, his best buddy. Again, doesn't play an integral role in the film. You do meet his wife in this one. Um, absolutely gorgeous character too. And 
Vi's sweetheart, Tony Ridinger, the sweet, the sweet young man who's hardworking and compassionate, who definitely has a crush on Vi as well. Edna Mote, one of my favorite characters of all time. Unapologetic, who she is, take it or leave it. She designs for the gods. She doesn't have time to mince words. The fact, the, the very, the way she's introduced in Incredibles 1, where she kind of looks and she kind of get the nostril cam of her and she goes, is that, oh my God, you're getting fat. You know, <laughs> that kind of a character. And I've mentioned this in some of my in some of my talks in the past. Brad Bird describes her as being based off of Bette Midler in the sense that she was a woman who had such incredible integrity that when she walked in the room, she did never try to pretend to be something she's not. She always knew who she was. She had an incredible sense of self. And when she'd walk into the room because of her integrity, she... The, the, the music would stop and everybody would just stop and stare at her. She would steal the show everywhere she went. And Edna Mode has that kind of energy. A little woman with a very big personality. Now, when you get into the wannabe supers, <laughs> some, again, secondary characters, but some absolutely brilliant thought. The bird character, who's based off of an owl, where they gave him the owl's ability to turn his head because owls have, I think, 14 cervical vertebrae, neck vertebrae, so they can turn their head all the way around because their eyes actually don't move in the socket. Humans have seven cervical vertebrae. So his head can twist sideways like this. Just brilliant. Or this character, inspired by the Sopranos, uh, in the sense that uh, one of the things that Brad Bird had mentioned that, um, or Ke Kevin O'Brien here had mentioned, is that he was impressed by how a lot of these secondary characters in Sopranos, which I still haven't seen to this day, yeah, I gotta catch up on that, um, were out of shape, ate crappy food type of characters, but still managed to be intimidating, despite not being by any stretch of the imagination, physically intimidating characters. So this character's based off of that in the sense that his superpower is ability to acid reflux fire. You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is like, and he's got kind of the frog neck as he belches out fire. I just, how clever is that? Now, something I've mentioned in book reviews in the past is these, what's called color keys. And again, something to mention with regards to this book in general that you might notice is that there's very little writing. It's mostly imagery that you're seeing in this book with little kind of descriptors here and there, which kind of goes to show that a picture should speak for itself. That the, the graphic design, the color, the composition, the camera work, the lighting, all of these different types of things should speak for themselves. And that very much uh, is, it's testament to this book where you can see where every single one of these color keys are walking you through what to emotionally feel and expect, depending on the lighting and color schemes, like exhausted Bob in the middle of the night trying to put trying to put Jack Jack to bed in his nursery, which will never happen because Jack Jack's a perky little baby, he never goes to sleep. Or, you know, the, the kind of like standard daytime type of shots, just kind of suburban life type of thing, just living their life and doing their thing, or back into the gritty underground of the underminer where you get these toxic greens and grays and desaturated colors. When you get into Edna Mode's world, <laughs> where Jack-Jack can take on Edna Mode, spoiler alert, where Jack-Jack can imitate who he sees, so he becomes a little Edna Mode, he gets a haircut and stuff like that. But you can see kind of like the, the glamorous golds and the deep dramatic blues and reds of Edna Mode's environment. So these spooky kind of tones of the reflective colors of the pool to get you into that kind of mood as well. Or the beautiful golden sunlight things. I think he's daydreaming at this point. I think he's dreaming of sleeping because he's so exhausted. So he's fantasizing about getting sleep. Now, when we get into the environment designs, this shows off another side of Brad Bird that he's aware of, that a lot of the teachers at the college I teach at, um, or taught at, at least I haven't taught there in a few years, but um, that is something that is very, very overlooked and taken for granted. Uh, that thankfully I get a chance to talk about today. And that is graphic design in the periodic sense of the word, in the different eras, different decades. And this is something that Brad Bird's always been very focused on. If you look at the Iron Giant, the actual film itself, the location is in the town of Rockwell, inspired by and an homage to the artist Norman Rockwell, who I teach. As far as visual storytelling and composition is concerned, I teach a lot of Rockwell. He's an exquisite visual storyteller. But his art is very pasted into the 1950s and 60s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And what Brad Bird does is he likes to tap into a lot of this graphic design from advertisements, book covers, um, things like that, film covers and all that kind of stuff, poster art. 
And he even has a book that I'm very interested in getting online called The Art of Mondo. You can find it on Amazon and it's it's an exploration of graphic design and poster art, so to speak. Different types of graphic designs that are very much like this, like capturing the French flair, the sophistiqué, because it has the E accent aigu, like little, the little thing on the E, or urban dining colors, or the trying to get into the more urban setting. And you can see a lot of this iconic urban downtown type of 1960s design because what he was trying to do on a very iconic level, on a very objective level, was bring the world of supers into an urban setting to show off the more job side of being a super rather than the suburban secret life type of thing. So it's a little bit more of a, they're a little bit more mainstream and now they're just doing the job. So they wanted to make it more of a mainstream thing. So they're capturing a lot of this iconic urban industrial setting type of stuff. More of the financial sector type of desaturated practical colors. Even this, there's a, there's a building in old Montreal where my grandfather used to work, the Sun Life building, which is a very iconic building in Montreal and used to be up until when Place Ville Marie was built, where I worked, where EA was, Electronic Arts, um, the Sun Life building was the biggest building in Montreal and it looks very much like these old buildings. It has this old design aesthetic to it as well. And the Royal Bank used to be, I don't know if it still is, one of them in old Montreal was one of the most gorgeous buildings. I walked in and I'm like, holy smokes, painted ceilings with mahogany trimmings and mahogany counters with you know with the with the brass nameplates and the brass pipes and just gorgeous marble design floors and i'm sitting there going this is a bank nowadays everything's brick very uninspired but he's capturing a lot of this iconic interior and exterior design i i, I miss that the the house design which was designed to be impractical this is a family of five and this house doesn't quite fit right together. It's kind of like the way they described it, the house is everything we aren't. It was supposed to be everything they dreamed of, but realized it's not them. They, they're, they're a family. And the, this kind of like overly stylized, very impractical design really didn't gel well with their family lifestyle. Again, very iconic graphic design over here that all conveys a certain mood, feeling, and message. I can't stress enough how you can never stop benefiting from learning stuff like this, from researching things like this. Because remember, people are always going to observe your art objectively before they observe it subjectively. People are always hit with a feeling before they even know what it is they're looking at. And this kind of stuff resonates with you very quickly before you even know what it is that you're looking at. And I'm gonna leave it there because of course I can't make these videos 16 million years long, but I wanna leave it on this. And that is Brad Bird set a precedent for me as an artist. And of course, all of the brilliant artists that he worked with at Pixar Disney. And that is mastery has nothing to do with your ability to calculate and compress large, large amounts of complicated data. It's in your ability to take something otherwise very complicated and simplify it. Make it something easy for the brain to understand. If you ever find as an artist that you're sitting there going, ah, yeah, this this composition and this placement of all these things is just, it's just overwhelming and you feel like you can't take control of this beast that is your artistic challenge. It's probably because you're getting carried away with too many details and you have to find a way to purge yourself of all of those distractions and focus on the things that matter most. If you want a good example of an artist who is, in my opinion, one of the poster children of this practice, Go and check out Marco Bucci's channel right now. In fact, one of his latest videos talks about that very thing, about min minimizing things and focusing on what matters. So definitely go check that out. And with that said, from me, from Adam Duff to Brad Bird and to all of you lovely people at Pixar, Disney, I love you guys. Thank you for your, your timeless work and your timeless effort. And thank you for continuing to this day to set a precedent for artists worldwide. And you deserve all of the praise that you get. So I love you. Happy painting, everybody. Stay safe, and I'll see you soon. Take care.